begin. Uh, we are going to finish up today our question of can a Christian socially drink alcohol? Uh, we began that last week. We'll finish that up uh, today. Before we do, we'll take, we'll take just a moment and have a prayer together, and then we'll begin. If you would, um, please continue to remember all those listed in the bulletin on our prayer list, um, as well as um, there's something, let's my mind forget who I was going to mention, but uh, Bill Bennett did have a procedure this week, so we'll continue to remember Bill, and are there any others? that maybe uh, are not on the list that we need to remember. Okay, so pray for Gary and that and the, all that comes back negative. If you would, uh, may we bow. Almighty God and Father above, thank you so much for loving and blessing us. Thank you, Father, for, uh, for the kind attention that, that you show us each and every day. Father, we, we pray that you'll please uh, bless our time this morning as we uh, think about and study your word. Father, we pray that, um, that you'll bless us in this, that, that you will... Um, that you will continue to bless our congregation. We pray in a special way as we're undergoing this, this eldership church and, and just pray, Father, for your guidance in that. Father, we pray for those who are on our prayer list, uh, those that we're, we're thinking about. In addition, we, we're especially mindful of, of Bill Bennett and Gary and, and Ann Goff and, and maybe others that uh, are not able to be mentioned this morning, but we just pray that you'll bless them and be with them. Father, um, it is such a blessing to, uh, to carry the name, to wear the name Jesus, um, to wear his name, and to be in his kingdom, Father. Father, we, we pray that you'll please uh, continue to forgive us of our sins where we fall short. And Father, please continue to lead us and guide us and direct us. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so... Um, just a way of reminder, um, today I believe is, is kind of the tentative deadline for uh, any elder forms. Uh, I, I don't know about the other guys, but I have not received any uh, to me. So if you, if you have a name you'd like to put forward, uh, please do that ASAP um, so we can see what the next step is. Um, so please remember that. Um, as, and it's good to see Jody back. He's been out for a little while. He recovered from, from the virus, so thankful. I meant to mention that before our prayer, but we're thankful he's able to be back here and, and be with us. Um, this morning, we are looking at the question of, can a Christian socially drink alcohol? Now, as I mentioned last week, I know this is a highly debated uh, topic that can get a little heated at times because... People are, have very strong opinions about it one way or the other. Um, but what I want to do is, is to avoid the, the area of opinion and, and to look really at the Word of God on this and, and, and look for His direction. Uh, you don't care what I think about it. It's not important. What's important is what God thinks about it. So in our last study, we... We looked at some of the Greek terms associated with uh, alcohol and with being drunk, drunkards, and drunkenness, and spent a little time thinking about those and, and what, what they mean. And then we looked at the Old Testament view uh, of alcohol and being drunk uh, with wine or with intoxicating drink. Uh, we, we especially looked at the book of Proverbs. Solomon has a lot to say about this particular topic. And then as we were concluding last week, we dealt with the New Testament um, uh, view of drunkenness. And so uh, one of the things we mentioned last week, one of the things I mentioned is there, there is no ambiguity in the New 
Testament in regard to to drunk, uh, to being drunk, to being a drunkard. Uh, we looked at several passages in that regard. Um, one particular passage um, that that we looked at was Ephesians 5 and 18. Uh, there Paul says pretty directly, he says, and do not get drunk with wine. Um, it's interesting, in doing a little further research in, into that phrase, do not get drunk, um, it comes from a Greek word that in, it has a, a meaning that indicates do not begin the process of getting drunk. I found that interesting. Uh, that Paul, Paul is saying to the Ephesian brethren, he says, don't even start down that road. And, and so um, we looked at those uh, passages, um, Ephesians 5.18 in particular. And in just a minute, I want to turn to uh, 1 Peter 4. And we're going to look at what Peter had to say uh, in addition to kind of what we talked about last week. Um, before I do, are there any questions about what we looked at last week? All right. Um, so, uh, before we go to First Peter, so the way the argument goes for those who try to argue that a Christian can socially drink alcohol, the the argument goes that we know the line is being drunk, being intoxicated. We know that the New Testament is very clear about that. You can't really, there's no argument. So the argument comes in that somewhere between no drinks and being drunk, they argue that that's okay, that God is okay with that, that it's okay to do that. Well, I want to think about that in a little bit more depth and deal with some difficult, pat, or not difficult passages, but passages that are used in defense uh, of that argument. Before we do, I want to go to 1 Peter 4, and I want you to think about something. 1 Peter 4, uh, beginning at verse 1, um, I'd let someone read it. I'd like to let you read it, but because of the online stuff, I'm not sure if it comes across very well. Hopefully, eventually, when we get the microphones in the auditorium where it picks up your, you guys better, we can do that more often. That would be my hope. Uh, but, uh, if you would, let's begin at verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Now you notice Peter begins there by drawing their attention to their example, Jesus. He says, I want you to have that same way of thinking, the same uh, Savior, Lord and Savior, who, who gave up heaven, who... who who allowed himself to be mistreated and abused, who then even went as far as die on the cross, all because he loves you. I want you to have that same way of thinking in regard to your walk with God. He says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Uh, so one of the reasons that as a Christian, I know there's others, but one of the reasons we cease from sin is because we're trying to follow the example of Jesus Christ. Um, we know he was sinless. Uh, we do not have a high priest who, who, is, who can't uh, uh, empathize with our weaknesses, but never quite tempted as we, yet without sin. And so we look to his example. So as a child of God, uh, Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And so, as a child of God, I am transitioning out of a lifestyle of sin into a walk with God in His holy way. And so, I am abandoning sin and pursuing righteousness. So, verse 2. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh. So, we have a past. Everybody in this room has a past. Every one of us has a past marred by sin of some sort. We may, as human beings, put degrees on it, but it doesn't matter degree. All of us, if we are a child of God, have a past without Christ, have a past in sin. But now, 
We are different. We are changed. We are, as Romans 12 verse 1 says, we've been transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so Paul says, I'm sorry, Peter says, so as to live for the rest of our time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time is past, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And so Peter's making comparison. The sinful world over here, and here we are as Christians. We don't live like them. We can't live like them. We now live to glorify God. And we live toward righteousness. And then he starts and he gives a list of things they do. Notice, living, sensu uh, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness. Again, that, that concept of drunkenness. Orgies. And then notice this one. Drinking parties. And lawless idolatry. Isn't it interesting that he puts drunkenness and then a whole different term or phrase, drinking parties. Now, what, if, if it was just drunkenness that was wrong in the eyes of God, why put the other term? He says drinking parties. Isn't that interesting? Social drinking, isn't it? Now, what a drinking party is? Social drinking, alcohol. He says, that's what the Gentiles do. And lawless idolatry. Then notice verse 4. With, this, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. You're at work, and the day is getting near the end of the day. And and everybody's going to go out to the local bar and drink. They invite you. And you say, well, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to do that. Anybody ever been faced with a little surprise by others when, when you talk about, I don't live like that? I bet you have. Many of us in here have. But we don't go into the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. Unfortunately, probably some of us have been maligned, maybe by our co-workers or, or those uh, in our communities. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And so he points them back to that ultimate day. Why are we doing what we do? Because we're looking forward to the second coming and for being home with, with Jesus. So I think it's interesting and, and worthy to point out here not only does Peter say drunkenness, he says drinking parties. And again, I ask you, what's the difference in social drinking and that? That is social drinking. And, and so he begins to define for us um, this idea um, of that it's more than just drunkenness. Now go back to Ephesians 5.18. Look up that Greek word. Do your homework. Don't believe me. But go back. Look it up. Beginning the process of becoming drunk. So you're really starting to narrow down this window of which they can say, I'm okay to drink a little alcohol. At what drink do you become, do you begin to become drunk? I would argue it's the first drink. You're on that road. But some may still argue. All right. The other argument uh, that is often given uh, for uh, for God allowing some alcohol is uh, sorry, lost this in my notes. Oh, First Timothy five twenty three. I know we dealt with this. I'm going to quickly go through it, and I just want to call your attention. We kind of went through it quicker than I wanted to last week. 1 Timothy 5.23. And um, I want to note just a couple of things about uh, this passage used a whole lot in defense of, of this argument. And I, I, want to, I want you to think about it one more time. So 1 Timothy 5.23. Paul writing to Timothy. And again, he's ending his letter and he's giving some final kind of encouragements, exhortations, some greetings, and some different things. So 
you'll notice in, in, at the end of a lot of Paul's letters, not all of them, but a lot of them, he gives a lot of um, uh, random information. So he's talking, he talks about several different things. And one of the things that he adds to Timothy is he says in verse 23, uh, and you notice this is in parentheses, um, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. Now I want to note a couple of things about this. So some say, see, there's Paul. He says, drink a little wine. So obviously, a little wine is okay. Now number one, we noted last week, you notice that Paul uh, signifies uh, degree there. So he, 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 uh, he puts that identifier, descriptive term, little. Why would he put little? Well, because he's wanting to, to, uh, to indicate to us a little bit. You also notice something else. It's not just straight wine. He says, no, only drink water, but add wine to it. Now, why would he say that? Now, there are a couple of reasons. Number one, in the text itself, he says, for the sake of your stomach and frequent ailments. Now, there's something going on with Timothy that's causing him some stomach pain, some kind of thing. So right away, we identify this is a medicinal use. This is not in a social context. This, this is kind of uh, belies their point about social drinking. This is not social drinking. So number one, it's for a medicinal use. And he says it's to be mixed with water. The other thing to note and this is historical, so this could be wrong, but it's been noted that Timothy at the time is living in Asia Minor. Asia Minor, um, historically, the water was not good. And you go to certain countries today, um, you, you know, you can, uh, I remember going to Mexico, one of the things they would tell you is don't drink the water. I've had people drink the water on, on some of our mission trips, and. They paid for it because there's things in the water that can cause stomach issues. Um, myself, I've dealt with those stomach issues, not from the water, but from other things in traveling on mission work. It's not fun. Well, one of the things alcohol might be used to do is to dilute or kill what was in the water. That, again, is historical. You can take that or leave it. Do your own research on it and if you agree with it or not. The other thing, though, is interesting to note here is that Paul has to tell Timothy to do that. That in itself says something about how Timothy and even Paul viewed alcohol. The fact he has to command him to do it rather than Timothy just, Timothy just have done it says something as well. But again, uh, this, I believe, has nothing to do with social drinking. I don't even understand why it's used. But I guess when you're grasping for straws, you look for anything uh, to defend an argument. All right. Um, now, let's look at a couple passages that were brought up. Yes, sir.
Yeah, I, I agree. Great. Any comments about that? Move on. Yes, sir. Okay, we're going there, so hold on to that. <laughs> That's a good question. It's really good. You're referring to John, chap John chapter 2. We're going to go there. So y'all go ahead and turn to John chapter 2. We'll be there in just a minute. But good question. So we need to deal with that in just a minute. Any other questions about anything up to this point? All right, let's go to John chapter 2. That's a common argument that's given uh, is... Uh, but let's look here at what's going on, and then we'll work, we'll work through it. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I want to deal with a couple of those issues, but that's a good point. There are a couple of issues that, along with what you're saying, it will come out. Let's go to John 2. Um, let's look here. Uh, John 2, let's begin at verse 1. Um, on the third day, there was a wedding at Canaan in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine... Uh, ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Uh, Jesus said to her, Woman, do, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And uh, Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said to them draw some out and take it to the master of the feast so they took it and when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine uh, and did not know where it came from though the servants had drawn the water new uh, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first uh, of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan of, in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. All right, so let's write this down. The son will come to this, and they say, See, Jesus turned water to wine, so... How can, how can it be wrong if Jesus turns water to wine? You have a social event, you have a wedding, people drinking socially. Well, let's again um, go back to the word used here. It's oinos. It's the Greek term. It's used all throughout here for wine. Every time it's wine comes up in the context, it's that word. Now, what did we say about that last week? That term is a generic term. It can refer either to grape juice, to the juice of grapes, fermented or unfermented. The only way to know the difference is by the context around it. So, we don't know definitively until we've studied the context what we're talking about here. Some things I want to think about. So, that word wine, in our minds, always calls... Uh, uh, calls to alcoholic drink. It's not the same for them. That's not how they would have viewed the term. All right, so let's think about this. So uh, you have a situation where the wine runs out and Jesus then performs this miracle. Now notice what's going on. Number one, they have six water pots that are each either 20 to 30 gallons. That's a lot of water. 
They filled each of them up, and then Jesus performs this miracle. Now notice what's going on. Jesus is turning water to wine. How much wine? You're looking at 120 to 180 gallons of water. That's a lot of drink, isn't it? It's a lot. You also notice something else. There in verse 10, as the, the master of the feast comes to talk to Jesus, he says, uh, you'll notice there, uh, he said, when people have drunk freely or some translations will have well drunk. So you have a situation where people are, in, are imbibing large, copious amounts of this drink. So you have people well drunk. Now, we've already looked at this and defined that drunkenness is a sin. The New Testament clearly defines it that way. So the question becomes, is this an alcoholic drink or is it just simply grape juice? Now, if it's just grape juice, no problem, right? They're just drinking a non-alcoholic drink, which we can all drink. We'll drink grape juice in just a few minutes in our worship as we memorialize the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No problem with that. Now, think about what you're saying if... You say this is alcohol. What you're saying is Jesus has just put together a drunk party. All these people were getting drunk. Now if Jesus did that, think about the implications. You're saying Jesus sinned. These people are drunk. And if you do that, what have you done to all of Scripture? And what do you say about Jesus? The reality is this is not alcoholic drink. This is a juice. It is just a general drink, like a great drink, with no alcohol in it. People go to this without studying the context or misusing Scripture because he simply is not talking about an alcoholic intoxicating drink in this context. Any questions about that? Yeah, I, I think well drunk because, uh, well, what does it mean? Well drunk means to be fully, like, engaged in it. So, Mm -hmm. so you're saying that the first round of wine was wine? Yes. They are no, 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 no. I'm saying that neither of it was, was alcoholic, that it was all grape juice. Because again, it, 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 even let's just say, for instance, that Jesus, that, that the first drink was alcoholic. We still have Jesus participating in a drinking party, and these people are drunk. I don't believe that can be the case either. This is a juice, not an alcoholic drink. Um, now, there's some who try to claim that they, they could not, uh, in that time, have stopped juice from fermenting. That's simply not the case. There's a really good book, and I can get you the title of it. I just right now don't recall it. But there was a, a man who did a very deep study on, on this issue. And he went back and looked at all the ways they had to prevent fermentation of grape juice. There were lots of ways they could do it. I can get you more information about that. Uh, I don't have that here, but, but, but if you want to study that further, um, uh, grape juice was just their common drink uh, other than water. Yeah, so I'm sorry if I gave that indication. I don't think either portion was alcoholic.
Yeah, because he would have been involving himself in their sin had he done that. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and there the qualifier good, I believe it's just simply a qualifier, the context indicates it's a qualifier of the quality of the grape juice. Like anything, there's good quality. And you ever gotten a drink from a gas or from a, a fast food place that's watered down or real syrupy? Ugh. That is the bane of my existence, one of them. Just kidding, but I hate that. Well, there are different qualities of everything. And He's trying to indicate the quality of Jesus' miracle. So Jesus took water, turned it to, to grape juice, and, and it's high quality. It's not watered down. And somewhere else, Becky, do you have a question? And I'll go over here. Okay, so it can, eat, it can mean to drink to intoxication. It can also mean drink well, to be fully drunk. Like, like uh, not drunk like alcohol. The, the indicator of whether it's intoxication or not has to do with the drink itself. So if I drink a whole lot of water, no matter how much I drink, no matter how much I consume, I'll never be intoxicated. Now, I may be bloated, I may, I may have an upset stomach, but no matter how much I drink, I can't get intoxicated from water. I put that same application to wine, I get well drunk on it, I'm well intoxicated. So, again, the the full definition of, of that word, the full meaning of or, or the understanding of that word depends on what's being consumed. So we're saying that John Wayne is divine in this verse. Mm -hmm. Disagree. Yes. Because I believe to set, make it say anything different than you're saying Jesus participated in a drunkenness. Um, yeah, that's my point is the word oinos is a general term for, for fruit or for uh, juice of a grape. Oinos is just a general term for, and it can indicate either fermented or unfermented. Context is what defines whether it's fermented or unfermented. Does that make sense? So it can mean either one. You have to study the context to know what it's actually meaning. Yes, ma'am. comments. I know this is a highly heated topic for some, so yes ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
And, and again, I go back to Ephesians 5.18. I encourage you to go back and study the Greek term there. But Paul is saying, do not get drunk. Uh, the, the indication from the Greek term there is beginning the process of becoming drunk. He says, don't even do that. Uh, uh, Yeah, I'm not going to have time to get through everything. <laughs> so we may come back to this in a couple of weeks because I think <laughs> I'll fill in and, and so Patrick will be back. He'll begin his study next week and then he's got to be out of town. So we'll come back and, and finish up the rest of this then. But let me, let me get to the next section unless there's another question. I don't mean to cut anybody off or comment. All right. Um, Let's go, I'm just thinking about the amount of time. Let's go to Luke 5. Well, I, I'll see how much I can get down on this. Luke 5, this is a, a comment that was brought up last week and I want to deal with. Uh, and then we'll move on. Luke 5, uh, let's begin at verse 33. Luke 5, 33. Um, and they said to him, to Jesus, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so, the, so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours, talking about his disciples, eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make a wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece of from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But the new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. All right, so let's, let's think about the passage, and then we'll talk about directly uh, verse 39. All right, so what's going on? What's the context? Now, first, I want to know that the meaning of this passage is not a discussion of social drinking. I want that to be noted first. As, uh, some, it's important to note what the point of the passage is. Now look at verse 35. This tells us what the point of this discussion is all about. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, from the disciples, and then they will fast in those days. So, um, so people are complaining about the, the fact that, um, that the disciples of Jesus are, are not fasting and praying as much as they think they should. And Jesus says, well, there's going to come a time when I'm no longer with them. It's during that time they will fast and they will pray. But while I'm with them, they're with me. They're not fasting. They're not praying. That, that will be reserved for later. So the point of the passage is what? He's, he's talking about his death, burial and resurrection and eventual ascension. That's the point of the passage and, and why his disciples are, are acting differently than they would suppose they should. And then he gives two parables. He relates the first one and notice the, the common terms here are new and old. The first one he talks about is taking a, a piece from a new garment and patching an old garment. He says, you don't do that. Why would you tear the new garment to patch an old garment? You just wear the new. Why would you do that? You go out and buy uh, a pair of pants for $50, $100, and you got an old pair of beat up jeans in the closet, are you going to take and cut a piece out of those new jeans to patch the old ones? Now, some of us don't say it. There's probably somebody in here who loves those old jeans, and you would do it because you love them so much. 
But typically, we're not going to go and destroy something that's brand new to fix something that's kind of worn out. That's true. I remember acid wash jeans and what was the other one? The rocks they would put in the dryers. We're silly human beings, what we do. But, um, but you get the point, right? You don't destroy the new to fix the old. Well, then he says, you don't go and put new wine into old wineskins because if the wineskin of the old burst, you're losing new wine. Why would you do that? You get a whole new wineskin, you put it in there so that it will be preserved longer. So before I, I deal with 39, and I'm out of time. Man, I want to get to that. We'll, we'll come back to this passage and we'll finish our thoughts there. In two weeks, uh, you get a break from me and then I'll get back up here. And, and then uh, we'll, we'll finish this up. Thank you so much.